Hello everyone and welcome to Amanpour and Company. Here's what's coming up. We're going to win. I wouldn't have said that three weeks ago. Three weeks ago, two weeks ago. President Trump says he's got this, but Democrats beg to differ after spending four years building a counter movement. I speak to grassroots organizers Leah Greenberg and Laurie Goldman. Then, at the end of the day, a democracy depends on a common purpose if we're going to have effective governance. What if this democracy doesn't work for the majority anymore? Our Walter Isaacson speaks to Harvard professor Danielle Allen about breaking the vicious partisan cycle. And despite all that's happened, and despite all that's still happening, there's still a possibility. A healing balm for dystopian America. We celebrate HBO's new film version of American Utopia with a look back at my interview with musician and star David Byrne. Almond Poor and Company is made possible by the Anderson Family Fund, Sue and Edgar Wachenheim III, the Cheryl and Philip Milstein family, Candace King Weir, the Strauss Family Foundation, Bernard and Denise Schwartz, Charles Rosenblum, Jeffrey Katz and Beth Rogers. Additional support provided by these funders and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to the program, everyone. I'm Christiane Amanpour in London. There are two weeks to go until the American election, either a blink of an eye or an eternity, depending on your mindset. And Donald Trump is playing defense on the campaign trail, holding non-socially distant rallies in key states like Arizona and Pennsylvania, which he won in 2016. As new COVID cases rise to numbers not seen since the summer peak, Trump is torching his own scientific experts, as one public health advisor calls it, attacking the fire department when the house is burning down. Meanwhile, Democrat Joe Biden leads in CNN's poll of polls by 53% to 42%. And he's on track to gather well more than the 270 electoral votes that he'll need to win the presidency. However, there are always the unknowns of actual election day or election week, as the case may be. 2020 is also a critical census year, as each state gears up to apportion power over the next 10 years. In the 2010 census, Republicans racked up major advantages in Congress and the states. Now, Democratic activists are fighting back at the grassroots level. Leah Greenberg is the co-founder of the Indivisible Project, and Lori Goldman launched her own action group, Femmes for Dems. Ladies, activists, welcome to the program. L Lori, let me turn to you. Lori, let me, let me turn to you because Femmes for Dems is a really very, you know, catchy name. And what we're hearing, especially in the suburbs, is the story of a gender gap and in certain major key swing states or key states, um, pr President Trump down by quote unquote record breaking margins. What are you finding in those voters who you're trying to target? Well, people are very excited. We still all have PTSD from our failure to elect Hillary Clinton as the first female president, but we're not losing hope and we're not taking anything for granted like we did back in 2016. So we're out on the streets, even when a lot of the Democratic Party and the Biden campaign wasn't out knocking doors, we thought it was very important to show what, that we're ready to go out and meet with the public and to let them know about our candidates and Joe Biden and his ticket and to get them motivated to vote. So we're also working very hard to stop voter suppression and to counteract it. Because on the November 3rd voting day, we have to make sure people have access to vote. They have a way to get there. They have a chair to sit in for a six or seven hour line, an umbrella to be held over their head, and a tuna sandwich to keep them sustained until they can get into their voting box. Okay, the, tu the tuna sandwich, that, that sounds really good. I'm going to play a soundbite uh, from President Trump uh, about 10 days ago or so, anyway, recently, when he appealed to those suburban, as he likes to call them, housewives. And he was playing the whole, you know, um, 60s Nixon law and order card. Let's just listen to this for a second. I don't want to build low-income housing next to your house, okay? Suburban women, will you please like me? Remember? Please. Please. 
I saved your damn neighborhood, okay? So I don't know how you pass that, but it is sort of a mixture of desperate and divisive because I'm not going to let them build low income housing in your neighborhood is a dog whistle or it's a full throated, you know, um, divisive uh, connotation there. Just quickly, uh, Laurie, what are women saying in, for instance, Michigan, which he won by, you know, over 10,000 votes the last time around? The women that I know, and they run in the thousands, and you can call us housewives, you can call us suburban, you can call us just women. We don't care what you call us. We're not stupid, and they're not stupid, and they don't even care what he says anymore. We're focused on the prize, which is November the 3rd. So we don't care what the president trots out to his acolytes, to the people that are starstruck and following him blindly. We're women. It's been hundreds of years since we've had our due, in fact, since the start of the world. And we're going to get what we want right now and keep going. Let me turn to Leah. Uh, back to you, Leah. Now we have your sound. Um, as I was saying, you heard the president say, this is the first time I'm saying that maybe we have a path to victory. I might not have said it a few weeks ago. And his campaign manager is at least briefing the press uh, on what he wants them to hear, which is that he believes that the president has a path to that 270 electoral college um, magic number. What are you hearing on the street with your grassroots action group? What, what, are, you, what are you sort of tapping into right now? Well, what we're hearing when we do voter outreach is very much along the lines of what Laurie said. People are tired and they are determined. They are tired of this administration. They're tired of the divisiveness. They're tired of the hatefulness. They're tired of the fact that they seem to be doing everything they can to actively prolong the national ordeal that we're experiencing with COVID. And they're determined. Um, we talk to a lot of voters who are grateful to have information about how to vote, but they are so fired up and so ready to vote, they want to vote yesterday. So what we're seeing is an unprecedented level of, of enthusiasm for voting this cycle. And I think you're seeing that as well in the early voting totals. And in terms of um, voter registration, there are lots of anecdotal and, and, and polling information that shows that the Republicans seem to be targeting right now very heavily more and more voters to register. How are you seeing that play out in the neighborhoods where you... I know you're a Democratic activist, but you must know what the other camp is doing. Sure. And obviously, you'd rather see those totals be higher rather than lower for the Democratic side. That said, I think that that is one stat among a lot that we are trying to put in context to understand the full picture of what's going on. And one of the things that we're seeing is that a lot of those voters, when you look at places like the Florida panhandle, right, those are people who they switched from being Democrats to Republicans a while ago in their voting patterns, and they're actually just now getting around to formalizing their party status. So those are people who they voted for Trump in 2016, and they've been factored into a lot of folks' political analysis of what's going on at the moment. And so while it is, while it's not the best stat, um, we want to look at the full picture of enthusiasm of uh, how, who's turning out and how and the polls to make it make sense. So you did start this Indivisible project along with your husband. I mean, you'd both been congressional staffers and you wanted to get out there and do something different. Um, what exactly are you doing? How does it work, your project? Well, we started Indivisible when we wrote a simple guide to congressional advocacy back in 2016, right after Trump had been elected. And the idea was very simple. We could replicate the Tea Party model of political activism. We could form local groups all over the country dedicated to pressuring our elected representatives to make sure that they uh, did not go along with Donald Trump, that they fought back, that they worked to save health care, um, and then ultimately turn those into political action units um, that were capable of helping to build a blue, big blue wave in 2018 and capable of helping to get Donald Trump out of office in 2020. So we formed our organization after that guide went viral and thousands of people all over the country started forming indivisible groups, um, small volunteer-based uh, communities dedicated to action. And these have formed uh, the basis for a lot of incredibly inspired, incredibly creative local organizing all over the country, from super rural areas to suburban areas to cities, red states, blue states, purple states. They're everywhere, and they are really dedicated to getting Donald Trump out of office and holding everybody who's been behind him accountable right now. 
Um, if Leah has been a, you know, in politics for a long, long time, Laurie, you haven't, have you? you you're not a, a politician, you're not a, a born activist. How did you come to this? Well, in February of 2016, I was so inspired and motivated that Hillary Clinton, a woman, a credible woman that was talented and able to be a fine president, was running, that I took a leap I sent an email out to 500 women, mostly a few men that I knew, asking who wanted to join me to try to make sure that this dream that has been so forestalled happened. And I got a great response. And ever since then, women and men of all colors, all backgrounds, all sexual orientations from our home in Oakland County to all the surrounding counties and even other parts of the uh, country and the world have been reaching out to join us. We believe super strongly in uh, relational organizing. So everything starts at home with your friends, your families, your neighbors, your hairdresser, your dog walkers, your grocer, and out from there. And if everybody does that, we can build a very strong network of uh, grassroots organizers, which we have. We're over 9,000 strong right now, and we keep in touch with everyone. We've built a family, a community, as our board chair, Julie Campbell Bode for Femmes for Dems likes to say. We activate, we engage, we inform, and when that election is over, we're not done, because even though we hope to have a president worthy of the Oval Office, we're going to make sure we work toward addressing all of the wrongs that have recently come to fore and have been here for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, and I, want, I just want to ask you about, because you are, I think, you know, going around knocking on doors in Oakland County, Michigan. Um, again, Michigan, the president won by uh, over 10,000 votes. It's not a massive, massive amount, um, but he won it. And these... His slogan, the soundbite that I, I played, his idea that suburbs are all housewife women, that, uh, that they're, they're all white, has, has really, A, it's outdated, and B, it's caused a severe backlash. What are you seeing, Laurie, when you're out there knocking on doors right now? Do you feel you have it in the bag for your team or not? Hey, I'm never going to have it in the bag after what happened in 2016. I'm never going to let myself feel that way. But a big difference from 2016 is that people that used to support Trump are in big numbers saying, I'm sick of both of them. I'm just disgusted. I'm not going to vote for Trump. I may not vote for Biden, but I'm not voting for Trump anymore. And that's a huge change from 2016. People have been very gracious, even when they're flying Trump flags and they have six foot tall uh, banners posted in their front yards. We still go to those doors. We knock on them and they may not agree with us and they may not be changing their vote, but they're not slamming the door in our faces. Because, uh, Christiane, after this election is over, we still have to live with one another. All right, and there'll be many more elections, God willing, after this one. So we have to be a community that we have to try to agree on those things that we can't agree on and disagree on those things that we can't, but we have to work together as a community. That's what Femmes for Dems is trying to accomplish. Well, well that, that's really very encouraging, the idea of trying to knit back a very fractured society. Um, I think a lot of people will be grateful to hear that there are activists trying to do that. Um, uh, Leah, you're also targeting up and down the ballot. So you're, you're talking about Senate races as well. There's some very tight races. And um, in terms of numbers, Republicans have to defend 23 Senate seats, Democrats only 12. What are you seeing about and, and what races are you focusing on in terms of the Senate? Well, what we're seeing with the Senate is that the map has expanded beyond what anyone would have thought were possible uh, possible pickup opportunities even earlier this year. Um, we are looking at races where people are getting scared in Texas and Alaska, where Iowa is now moving into a toss-up or even a lame Democratic status. That is uh, not what anyone predicted earlier in the year. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that these are folks who have tied themselves so closely to Donald Trump for the last four years. And as his popularity is plummeting, so is theirs. So you have folks like John Cornyn, who is now, just now, in the last couple of weeks of this election, trying to distance himself from Donald Trump after four years of enabling his agenda. And it's not working out. 
And you don't do that unless you are seeing some pretty scary internal polling numbers and you are really starting to get worried. So what we're seeing is the map is much bigger than we would have expected. And there are going to be some real surprises on election night. You know, I, I talked about what Indivisible is, is aiming to do, and, and you just mentioned also, and also, Laurie, it's not just about the election, it's about after the election, it's about protecting democracy. What about the census? Leah, you're doing quite a lot of work to try to bolster the idea that the census actually does represent everybody um, who's eligible to be counted. And your aim is to fix, you know, democracy through electoral reform and campaign finance reform. How are you reading all the latest rules around the census, what the, you know, the, the stopping of the count and uh, this and that? T tell me how that's playing into your attempt to use that um, to continue this grassroots activism. Well, I think it's incredibly troubling what the Trump administration has been doing, and we should not be shy about recognizing that this is part of a broader project of theirs. They are trying to systematically undercount some sets of people so that they can actually uh, maintain political power. Then specifically, they are trying to undercount black and brown folks. Uh, the latest ruling, particularly on their latest effort to not count immigrants specifically, this is all part of a political project that's about maintaining white control. Um, that's about continuing to advantage largely more rural, more conservative, whiter areas of the country over diverser areas. And so we should be, uh, we should understand that in the same vein that we understand their voter suppression efforts, that we understand their gerrymandering, that we see um, all of their attacks on protests. This is part of their effort to repress the power of the people. And Laurie, finally to you, we've got a short period um, left. You know, everybody talks a lot about the biggest voting block. It's going to be millennials for the first time. You know, the baby boomers are not the biggest ba voting block um, for the 2020 election. What are you seeing, uh, not just in women mobilization, but the youth in the areas that you're working? Well, when we've been canvassing through the uh, Oakland County and the Michigan Democratic Party, uh, we've been sent to houses where I scratch my head because I know the people that live in the houses and I know they're staunch Republicans. But I look at the list and it's their 18, 19, 20-something-year-old children that are making the switch. They're not following their parents into their Republicanism. They're becoming Democrats and they're voting and they're voting in very large numbers. And I think that Trump has done himself no favors by being so behind the times in his feelings about minorities and immigration and health care and all the things that he's against. He's just he's helped us immensely. Thank you, President Trump. Well, on that note, Laurie Goldman and, and Leah Greenberg, thank you so much indeed for joining us. Now, while so much of politics in America today is about winner takes all, our next guest makes the case for unity. Harvard professor Danielle Allen is director of the university's Center for Ethics, and she spearheads their COVID-19 response initiative. Here she is speaking to our Walter Isaacson about that major roadblock to governance, as we've heard, rampant factionalism. Thank you, Christian, and Professor Danielle Allen, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Walter. Good to be here. Now, we're going through a hellacious period, and you've written about a concept called becoming citizens again. What do you mean by that? Well, I think for a long time, many of us have sat back and sort of expected the powers that be to take care of our security and well-being. There's been reductions in participation, voting, and so forth. We all know those facts and details. And I've really been working hard to try to reinvigorate civic spirit and encourage people to rejoin the community of free and equal self-governing citizens and participate directly in as many ways as possible. And you've won the Kluge Prize at the Library of Congress, and part of that is our common purpose. Explain what you're doing with that. Sure. Well, I was really fortunate to serve over several years on a commission sponsored by the American Academy of Arts and Sciences that was investigating the future of democratic citizenship in America. And it was an incredible experience. We interviewed people all over the country, really learned about the challenges and obstacles to participation and thought about pathways to solutions. One of the things that came to the fore though, really, was the fact that we do lack a sense of common purpose in this country. And that's not a small thing. It's not a sort of an airy fairy thing because at the end of the day, a democracy depends on a common purpose if we're going to have effective governance. We have to be able to consolidate and converge and come together around some shared goals. 
And what is that common purpose in America? Well, I think we have to make it. We have to get back to the business of making it. So to take a very concrete example, when the COVID crisis hit, you might have thought that we would really have a strong common purpose that was about defeating the virus, really suppressing it. And to some extent, in the very early weeks, that common purpose did exist, but it fragmented really quickly. It got sucked into the kind of polarization and gridlock of fighting in Washington. And we just sort of watched the potential for a common purpose you know, dissipate, dissipate and fade away. But that would be an example of where we really needed a common purpose so that our federal government, our state governments, our local governments could actually work in concert to suppress the virus. We could have achieved it. We could have really driven spread back down to zero early on if we'd had that common purpose. I guess the enemy of common purpose is what the founders called factionalism. They kept warning against it. George Washington's, I guess, uh, farewell address talks about that. Tell us what we learned from that farewell address. Exactly. It's a really powerful speech. Washington warns about the dangers of faction. And his warning is really that once you have a situation where people aren't willing to focus on a unity principle on coming together, then people really are in a sense, they're fighting to the death and they'll hand their fortunes over to whichever figure just seems more powerful in a near-term moment for getting an immediate victory. And so people will sacrifice the sort of preservation of a kind of long-term structure for making decisions together just for their short-term wins and victories over their adversaries. Do you think we're seeing that now? I do actually, yes. I think it's the thing that most afflicts our politics is that we've all become much more focused on complete victory over our adversaries than on the fact that our flourishing, our participation in a society of free and equal self-governing citizens actually depends on our preserving the tools we use to make decisions together, depends on being able to govern together, to find compromises, to forge solutions that bring together different interest perspectives, it's the ability to govern that way, again, with compromises, with synthetic solutions, that makes us free. That's the thing that we've lost sight of. So we think we want a victory on climate, or we think we want a victory on guns, but we're pursuing those themes so aggressively that we're losing sight of the fact that we can't actually have any victory that matters if we've lost the freedom of sound, functioning, constitutional democracy. But what do you say to Democrats who have you know, faced four years of Trump with no compromise, no compromise? How do you tell them if, if Biden wins, you now got to go back to the principles of compromise? So this, Mitch McConnell really, I think, has conveyed the politics of our age and certainly the politics that the Republicans have been practicing for the last period of years. And he's famously said, you know, winners make policy and losers go home. That's exactly the wrong way to think about democracy. So at the end of the day, there's no point in participating in a democracy unless even if you lose out in a particular vote, you're still incorporated in the overall decision making. So the right attitude is that winners get to chair the committee meetings where decisions are made, but losers are still on the committee. And it's that orientation that we have to have. It's a big ask at this moment, I agree, when the Democrats have suffered under that incredible totalizing adversarial perspective driven by Mitch McConnell. It's a big ask not to turn around and want to do it right back. And I honestly think we have to summon Lincoln's spirit in this moment and, and, and you know, try to embrace the idea with charity to all, with malice toward none. Um, we're going to lead and you know, we're going to take those chairmanships of every committee and we're going to lead and shape the agenda. But yes, you know, losers, you'll be in the conversation too. You talk about compromise and, you know, your great historian, Benjamin Franklin, at the end of the Constitutional Convention sort of conveyed the message that compromisers may not make great heroes, but they do make great democracies. I know that in your report, you quote that wonderful speech of Franklin, too. So what do we learn from that? So the Franklin quote is really powerful. For me, in all honesty, it really cuts two ways. I mean, he stands up in the last day of the convention and says, basically, it's time for us all to commit to this. Whatever reservations we may have had about it will die here. We will never share them in the public. We will all stand in full consent behind this. We use that in our commission when we are trying to develop recommendations for uh, democracy innovation, democracy reform. We wanted to achieve consensus. People had different levels of uh, preference or affirmation for the different proposals on the table. But we collectively agreed we would bury our reservations uh, there in that committee room. So Franklin does set a model for what you need in a democracy. I said his quotation cuts both ways, and it does, because of course, in that context with the Constitution, he was burying reservations, as were others, about the compromises around enslavement. For example, the Three-Fifths Clause 
that counted enslaved people as three-fifths of a free person. Um, and there were people already at that point of the convention who did object to enslavement. You know, abolition had already been achieved by the time of the Constitutional Convention in both Massachusetts and Pennsylvania. So the reservations were real and serious, yet they accepted that compromise. For me, that really means you have to kind of bear down on the question of what makes the difference between a good compromise and a bad compromise. Why would the slavery compromises be out of bounds? What's, what counts as a good compromise? As you push back against the forces of faction and divisiveness, you talk about the need for unity. Is unity just a practical thing or is there a moral component to unity when it comes to the United States? There is a moral component and it comes back to this word I often use, human flourishing. Okay, now there's probably a long distance in people's money. How do you get from unity to human flourishing? Danielle, explain that one. It comes back to the idea that human beings thrive to their fullest when they are empowered. When they are empowered to chart their own life course, or as we sometimes say, pursue happiness. Um, and when they are empowered as decision makers in their communities, contributing to our collective decisions. So from my point of view, human beings thrive, again, they flourish, they do well when they're empowered. That then leads to a puzzle. How do we maximize our chance for empowerment? The answer there is free self-government in a constitutional democracy. And the problem is, of course, you always have in any given decision, people who win and people who lose, right? That's the problem. So the, the number one problem a democracy has to solve is what can make it worthwhile for the losers to continue to participate. Otherwise you start to fragment and break up. So a commitment to free self-government is the thing that motivates people's willingness to go along with decisions, even if they're not what their first choice would have been. You talk too about civility, but civility is not an end in of itself, right? Sometimes you need heavy pushback. So civility is not actually a word I use too much. I would separate unity from civility. Um, so I take unity to be that commitment to maintaining the institutions of free self-government among free and equal citizens, the institutions of constitutional democracy. You can fight hard in the context of maintaining that commitment. Um, it's great when you can fight civilly, when you can have civil disagreements, but sometimes there's a need for social movements or taking to the streets as a part of the element of fighting. So it's more the commitment to the project of constitutional democracy, being able to convey that commitment through articulating, expressing what the vision for common purpose is, for being willing to tap into a personal love of country, share that love of country with others, those are the kinds of things that I think are important for anchoring common purpose. Uh, Senator Mike Lee said something uh, a few days ago about democracy is not the objective, he said. He said, liberty, peace, and prosperity are, we want flourishing, as you put it, but ranked democracy can thwart that. Is democracy simply a tool or is it actually an objective? So this is an important conversation. It's an objective in the sense that democracy is a thing that we do, it's an activity. We are fulfilled in the activity of participating in constitutional democracy. Now, I have to though say a little bit more about Senator Lee's comment because something really important is happening there. At the dawn of our country, at the dawn of our constitutional democracy, the founders used both the vocabulary of a republic and of a democracy. So. Hamilton in the Constitutional Convention in New York um, referred to what had been designed as a representative democracy. Madison and Federalist Papers spent a lot of time saying it's a republic, not a direct democracy like those ancient Athenians had, right? So the vocabulary was all over the place. They did use both terms. But in the 20th century, among Republican circles in particular, there's become a habit of saying that the country is a republic, not a democracy, that the founders chose a republic not a democracy. And what people have meant by that is that the founders chose a hierarchically structured entity, not something that focused on universal suffrage, universal participation. This used to be a kind of pedantic red herring argument, but it is actually becoming an ideological argument. And this is the thing that I'm concerned about. So I think when Senator Lee said that, he is actually positively embracing a view that we should roll back the development of a, a robust commitment to universal suffrage, that we should roll back a commitment to egalitarian participation. So I think it was not a trivial comment. We have to pay attention to it. We should hear it. Um, and it's a funny thing where 
a red herring pedantic argument about are we a republic or are we a democracy has, I think, begun to turn into an actual ideological um, position. And do you tie that into voter suppression even? This is my concern, yes. My concern is that um, on the right, there is beginning to develop a proactive um, argument that is uh, undercutting the hard-won commitment to universal suffrage. You're an African-American with, as you once put it, a complex family history. How does that give you insight on what I would call our nation's complex family history? Well, Ralph Ellison is one of my presiding spirits. You know, we all have our few spirits who live in our heads and hearts um, every day. And Ralph Ellison was somebody who, you know, he's got this beautiful essay, What Would America Be Like Without Blacks, he said. And it's this incredible account of what everything that ex exists in this country and the ways in which African-American experience has given it meaning. And one of the things that African-American experience has given the deepest meaning to is the concept of freedom, okay? So insofar as this is a liberty loving country, well, African-Americans know that in a deeper and truer way than anybody. And that is, we, it's universal. Everybody is part of that story, is in it and welcome and shares it absolutely. Others have their own stories of oppression and domination and escape that give them to that deep connection to the story of freedom. But it's just important to say that because sometimes we think that these sort of ideals we have kind of came down on high from young men in white wigs. So that was looked older than they actually were. But in fact, it's the lived experiences of people in this country who struggle to achieve their own empowerment that have given us collectively our deepest understanding of the value of freedom. There's been a pushback on some of the uh, historical American narrative, especially from progressive. Do you think in some ways that can go too far? I think it has gone too far. So the story about race and racial domination in this country and its, the depth of its impact is, is absolutely real and accurate. At the same time, however, the story of abolitionists and their hard work, which started already in the early 1700s, has disappeared from view. And it's really important to recognize that the voices of abolitionists were actually fundamental to the Declaration of Independence, to the Constitution. Their voices were already working at that point in time, and they gave this country gifts of vision that we're still working on achieving the full result of. You're teaching a course at Harvard this semester called After the Pandemic, and I guess we're all hoping for that. But what are we going to try to build after the pandemic to make it better than it was before? Well, I hope we can achieve a new social compact. I was really personally shocked at the start of this pandemic by how quickly people were willing to abandon parts of our population. So for example, the language about elderly Americans, maybe we should just let them go, it's their time, or the slowness that we had in terms of getting PPE and so forth to essential workers, um, this kind of thing. And so from my point of view, a healthy society depends on a first principle being we don't abandon anybody. In a moment of crisis, we don't abandon anybody. We do the hard work of figuring out how we can maximize well being, the health and safety of the people for all. So I think we need, honestly, articulation of a moral vision. Um, we need leadership in doing that at all levels of our society. And then we need policies that make real that concept of not abandoning anybody rebuilding a public health infrastructure. We've let that erode in this country. Um, finally building a viable health infrastructure broadly for individual health and well-being. Um, rebuilding foundations of educational opportunity which have eroded significantly. So how do we turn ourselves back to the right direction? Well, so leadership at all levels matters, but every citizen can be a leader. That's the important thing. And so this is where I do think that in every decision-making context, it's really important to be a bridge builder, to find people who have different kinds of social experiences or different political perspectives, and try to figure out how to build a conversation in which you can participate together on decision-making. How can you rebuild for your community a sense that you want a social compact that really is good for all, where nobody is abandoned? What does that mean? I've had the pleasure of speaking with a number of mayors over the course of the last few months who are engaging their communities in exactly this kind of discussion. They're staging workshops and fora on the question of what kind of social compact their cities want. And that feels to me like the work we have to do. We need to be in the same space, 
look at one another and ask the question of how we can achieve well-being for all of us. Professor Danielle Allen, thank you for being with us. Thank you, Walter. Thanks so much. Really fascinating insights. Now, another sort of antidote to the toxic politics of today. To rave reviews, HBO has just launched the film adaptation of David Byrne's Broadway masterpiece, American Utopia. The film is directed by Spike Lee. As people, we're a work in progress. Who we are, it extends beyond ourselves. To the connections between all of us. Byrne, of course, headed the cult classic band Talking Heads. And with New York City's Broadway, London's West End and live musical performances everywhere devastated by coronavirus, his new film is a reminder that the indomitable creative spirit will survive to flourish again. When I spoke with David Byrne in the before times when Broadway was still packing the house, we talked about his vision of a diverse and harmonious American utopia. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Good to be here. So, American Utopia, it might sound a little sort of, you know, off kilter, really, in this, as we've described, partisan and kind of toxic atmosphere. But you say it without any irony. I mean, you're quite careful to say this is not a, 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 an ironic statement. Yes. It's not meant ironically. It's meant to be, well, as, as a friend from London who saw the show early on said, well, the utopia is right there on stage. We see it. We see what's possible. We see what, what can be or what we can aspire to. And, and, and it's not just like we're empty words. It's like there it is. There's evidence. And you took some very important themes and highlighted them. Give me one of them. <laughs> the utopia. What do you see on the stage? You talk about your band, for instance. Yes. Uh, the band is from a lot of different places all over the world. There's people from different races, different genders, uh, all, yeah, all that is very mixed up. In a way, I feel like that's America. That's the America that I know. That's the America that I think what America stands for. Is. You're an immigrant yourself. I'm an immigrant myself. Mm -hmm. I mentioned that. I mentioned that my parents brought me over from Scotland when I was little and that we've all made homes here. And I just wonder what kind of reaction you get from the audience, from people who come back and see you. What, what do they say about what you're trying to say and what you are saying there? They tell me that it's, uh, it, well, they tell me that it gives them hope, mm -hmm. that it's a tonic, that it's something that they need right now, uh, this sort of thing, which could make it sound like it's just like, oh, this is gonna cheer you up. This is like a happy little thing. This, it, we hit on a lot of issues. We talk about a lot of things that are kind of dark. And, but in the end, we kind of show you that here we are. We're, we're together in this. See, I think that's really interesting because, as you say, a lot of the music is very up. But as you've just touched on, there are issues that are very dark. And one of them, I just want you to explain. You asked Janelle Monet mm -hmm. for her permission to sing her song, um, essentially in English, it's what the hell are you talking about? But it's called uh, what hell is you it? tell what is hell you tell about, which is street talk, correct? Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. And this is uh, d describe it. Describe what it is because it's got audience participation, which I didn't expect. Yes, it's it's a song that she sang at the women's march years ago, and I'd heard a recording of it, and I thought it was incredibly moving. <laughs> And essentially, it's like a, a drum march mm -hmm. kind of rhythm, drum line kind of thing, with a kind of gospel shout. And basically, it's just asking people to remember the names of these young people who've been killed, murdered, as many would say. And police violence. Yes, police violence. Uh, and it doesn't say anything else. It doesn't point fingers. It just says, remember their names. Say their names, and we say their names. Yeah. Uh, the audience does that. And uh, it's, so it's not uh, us kind of assaulting the audience or accusing people. Uh, it's saying, just remember this. Remember this. Remember these lives that have been taken. And you also, you know, again, mention... Uh -huh. And it's very interesting because you say, that, have you seen in the, in the lobby, we've got these big signs that say register to vote. 
Why did you decide to do that? I've been doing that for a long time. Uh, <coughs> voter, turn <laughs> voter turnout, as I mentioned in the show, the turnout for the 2016 election was the best it had been in decades in the United States, and it was 55%, which to me is still kind of pathetic. Um, I'm personally in favor of mandatory voting. Yep. There like the Australians do, and it's yeah, very the successful. The Australians do it. They do it in Brazil. They do it in other places. It's not perfect. Um, some people don't vote, and they just pay the fine. But overall, it does better. And the idea that everyone has a voice is a big start mm -hmm. at fixing a lot of things. So for those who will remember you, obviously, from the talking heads, your body movement was very sort of rigid. You were kind of rooted to the floor in front of a mic, and it was just very different. Here, you look much more expansive. Your movement is much more joyful or unbridled. Well, what's happened in the interim? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, we get older. Uh, and it's not just age, but it's kind of like as time goes by, mm -hmm. we change as people. We're not, we're not the same people we were 20, 30, I don't know how, how long it is, years ago. About 40 -ish. Yeah, 40 years ago. And it's good, yes. Um, there's things that get lost. There's qualities that get lost. Some of that kind of angst and rigidity mm -hmm. is kind of charming in a way. And the fact that it's not entirely there anymore might be seen as a loss, but there's other things that get gained. Were you actually also, I think, saying something? I think you were talking about back then stripping away the stripped back nature yes. of the music and the performance in the 80s. In the early days, yes. I wanted to strip everything back and say, okay, we're not going to have any received notions. We're not going to dress like rock stars. We're not going <laughs> to move like rock stars. We're not going to do all the things that, that maybe we're supposed to do. We're going to start from nothing. Mm -hmm take everything down, start from nothing, and let's build things, add things on, uh, that really feel like they belong to us. See, you're still not dressed like a rock star. You always really <laughs> worn the suit, and you're still wearing it, <laughs> and you wear it, you wear it on the, on, uh, in American <laughs> Utopia as well. Does the suit say something? Uh, uh, it was a feature in the film. Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> Stop making sense. Very early on in my career, I, I uh, tried wearing a suit on stage, <laughs> and. Um, I bought a very cheap suit at an outlet downtown, and <laughs> and uh, in, a, in a in a rock club it gets very very sweaty. <laughs> so I threw it in the washing machine, <gasps> and it just shrunk. Yeah. And I realized uh, at this stage in my career this is not a very practical thing. But the idea was I wanted to look like every man. Mm -hmm. I wanted to look like I wasn't wearing um, what. You, what would you do expect? You weren't Elton John, let's say, in terms no, of I wasn't stage Elton clothes. John, but I wanted to look like um, I want. I wanted my outfit to disappear. Mm -hmm. It's not impossible. It's not possible. I was deceiving myself, but I wanted my outfit to disappear, and so that what I was saying, what I was doing, the music would be what you paid attention to, not the kind of other kinds of trappings. I learned better that you can't make things disappear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe. You made your shyness maybe disappear. I, I you know, and yeah. reading about you and listening to previous interviews, I was, you know, quite surprised to hear how shy you were as a child and obviously how not you are now. Tell, tell me about the shyness and what the stage meant for you. Yes, I was very shy uh, as, a, as a child, as a, as a young adult performing. I would do be my crazy self on stage and then retreat and kind of not talk to anyone afterwards or go into a corner, mm -hmm. all those kinds of things. Uh, it, to a lot of people, that seems like, uh, how could you do that? How could you be on stage if you're shy? But that explains it exactly. That became my outlet, my way to kind of uh, put myself out in the world, to say what I had to say, to communicate to people, to announce my existence, and then I could close up again. And gradually, I think by playing music, my career, working with musicians, performing, the joy of performing in music, I think it started to change. It's sort of like I invented my own therapy. 
Mm. <laughs> and over the years it worked. Okay, so that leads me to, you know, obviously the Talking Heads. Um, you, you founded this group uh, with, with your other, other, other members there, and then it kind of broke up somewhat acrimoniously. Why did it, why, why was it acrimonious, the breakup? And Tina Weymouth, who was the bassist, right? She, yes. yes. Yep. She had said something like, David Byrne doesn't react emotionally. He doesn't, he doesn't react emotionally with us. Tell, tell me about what was going on. Do you, do you accept that? I don't remember exactly, but she might have, there might be a, a grain of truth to that. Mm -hmm. I, I couldn't accept that I may have been uh, a, a somewhat colder, less understanding person than I was, than I am now. Um, it's a, a lot of people say this, but I tend to think that it's true, that I think a lot of our parting was, was very musical. I had gotten very interested in Latin and Brazilian rhythms and all this kind of thing, which meant that I really had to work with other, mm -hmm. other kinds of musicians, which I did. And you not only did that, I mean, you, you scored the original score for The Last Emperor, you won an Oscar for that, uh, you've got all sorts of other interests, including, I mean, I know that you biked over here. You are a fervent biker. You've got a charity for that too, right? Bike Rack you started? Oh, I did some bike yeah. racks for the city yeah. and for uh, yeah. the Academy of Music in Brooklyn and different mm -hmm. places. Um, I started biking uh, quite a while ago as just a way of getting around in New York. It seemed very practical, uh, a little risky. Mm -hmm. uh, it's gotten easier. There's more secure bike lanes now. Um, you can get from one place to another in a very kind of protected way that you couldn't before. But I found it just a joy. Um, the kind of the sign of floating under your own power and the wind in your face and you can stop and look at things or s examine stuff or go into a shop or whatever it might be, whenever you want. It's, you feel like it's just you floating through all this, not through heavy traffic, I hope. Um, it's and good for your mind. Yes, I found it really mm. good for my mind. It cleared my mind. If I, on my way to work in the morning, going to an office or whatever, uh, it kind of clears your mind. Or you, and at the same time, you're kind of thinking about uh, the, what you're going to do that day. Uh, it's like when you sleep on an idea and it, you wake up and you have the solution. It does a little bit of that. <laughs> of course, there's other benefits like um, yeah, carbon footprint and all that kind of stuff. But I... To me, that's not the reason I did it. Uh, I do it because it feels good. I want to play a little clip that we have of, I mean, it's, it's a long time ago now. It was a performance you did on the South Bank show, and it's, you know, a, a classic talking head psycho killer. <laughs> So that was a little clip. Do, what do you feel when you see that? Do you miss the talking heads? No, not, not so much. I mean, I've gone on to do a lot of things. The fact that now we've ended up with a show that is incredibly emotional, which I thought, me? Me do something <laughs> incredibly emotional? Look, look where you've come to. So tell me, that's interesting, because I did bring that up a moment ago, but doing smaller, intimate gatherings. What does that mean for you? What, what sort of different vibe do you get from that? There's a, a much more intimate connection. There's a much more a closer connection with the audience. Uh, they, and they feel closer to us as performers. Um, for me, it gives uh, me an opportunity kind of, kind of to take things a little slower, step by step, tell a story, take the audience on a journey. Whereas with a big concert, it's kind of like entertainment and celebra celebration and everybody have a good time. But in this, you can kind of connect the dots and take people from one thing to another where it actually leads somewhere. So what else is next for you? Uh, I have a couple of things I'm working on. Thank you for asking. <laughs> I have a, I guess it's what, what's called <laughs> Solutions Journalism Project. Serious. Uh, uh, called Reasons to be Cheerful. Yes. Um, we're very small, but we're uh, doing work and putting out articles and uh, posts and things like that of successful initiatives that we find around the world. So give me an example. Oh, okay. Um, I mean, you see something and then you match it with something cheerful, is that right? Well, we, it's generally some sort of, uh, some, some problem in the world, and we found, find a place that has 
found a solution mm -hmm. to that, and we want to make that known. Like here's, so, for instance, the I think the last two pieces that I wrote were on housing. Housing is a huge issue mm -hmm. in London, New York, San Francisco, you name it. Housing, homelessness, all these kinds of things. So, I asked some people, and they said, "Okay, you should check out Vienna and Singapore. Two different, very different places, very different approaches to this, but both of them, in their own ways." have kind of solved the housing problem. And in the process, they solve other problems. Um, for instance, Vienna, it's a, it's a long story, but... but we've only got 30 seconds. Yes. In solving the, the, the housing problem, housing for everyone in the city, they've also made it so that uh, you can't tell how wealthy someone is by their address. Okay. Everything is, everyone's mixed, mixed up. Reasons to be cheerful there. And of course, one of the reasons to be cheerful is the idea of being able to sit together without masks and have real conversations. And of course, that show is now a film and it's available on HBO Max, part of Warner Media, the parent company of CNN. And of course, for many around the world right now, renewed cheer and light at the end of a long, dark tunnel would come in the form of a COVID vaccine. China is cautiously but steadily rolling out trials of its version, and correspondent David Culver went to the city of Yiwu, an international trading hub close to Shanghai, to meet the people who are eager to get in line. They arrived early from all over China. Folks lured to the international manufacturing hub of Iwu City, specifically to this small community hospital. This is one of the first public locations where China's rolled out an experimental COVID-19 vaccine. They began injecting people over the weekend. The cost, about 60 US dollars for two doses. Word spread quickly. Some showed up Monday thinking they'd get a shot. Annie Ku among them. This is something really important to you, isn't it? I asked her. Yes, she replied, adding, because, well, if you have the vaccine, it's much safer to leave the country. For more than 20 years, Ku's worked in import-export in Chile and returned home to China amidst the outbreak. She flew to Iwu the night before we met her. It's a two-hour flight from her home in southern China, eager and admittedly a bit desperate for immunity. And so they told you they don't have any, and so you have to go find another place. Hospital staff confirmed to CNN that they had run out. Local officials later announced this distribution was only for those with specific foreign travel needs and pre-approval. Ku was not the only one disappointed. Notice the groups of people waiting around the hospital parking lot. Some of them traveled in from neighboring provinces wanting the vaccine. Yeah, would you take the vaccine? Originally from Syria, we met Enes Chahota as he pulled up with his young daughter and wife in the back seat of their car. He was curious, if not also a bit hesitant. If, if you were to walk in there and they had it, would you take it today? Uh, actually, I don't know. I don't, I don't have the answer. As you kind of go through this main entrance here, we do know folks are going in to inquire about how they might be part of this trial, essentially. Because you've got to remember, this is part of the emergency approval use granted by the Chinese government. This is not an actual release of an approved drug as of yet. The vaccine distributed at this Iwu hospital is made by Sinovac Biotech. It is one of more than a dozen Chinese companies working on a coronavirus vaccine. At the time of our visit in late summer, they were constructing a new facility to meet the production demands while still going through phase three clinical trials, which have not yet concluded. It all seemed to be happening at rapid speeds. None of the staff is uh, sacrificing any quality of our vaccine. So because Sinovac's goal is to provide a vaccine with good quality, good safety, good immunogenicity to, to the people in the, in the world. China has been trying to push past the early allegations of mishandling, cover-ups, and silencing of whistleblowers surrounding the initial outbreak in Wuhan. And instead, officials here have highlighted their swift and seemingly successful responses to many cluster outbreaks. The most recent in Qingdao last week, following a major travel holiday. After only a handful of confirmed cases surfaced, health officials began strict contact tracing and tested more than 10 million people in less than a week. And life, it seems, quickly returned to near normal again. But that's mostly within China, a bubble of sorts. For some whose livelihood is rooted in other parts of the world, where cases are surging once again, their only hope may be the vaccine. Annie Koo and the others now on to the next location to track one down. 
David Culver for us there. And finally, last week we reported on this program that tens of thousands of people around the world, predominantly young, had signed up to get deliberately infected with the virus in order to help fight it. Well, now the British government has approved this first human challenge study at Imperial College London in the form of controlled clinical trials. It's all part of the effort to understand the virus better, faster and find a vaccine. And two volunteers told us why this is so important to them. I can you know, potentially protect thousands of other people from you know, having to be infected without consenting to it. This was a way for me to take my control of the situation to be like, okay, I can do this to make it better. I chose not to be in fear. A reminder of just how seriously the younger generation is taking the situation and how much they want to be part of the solution to the crisis of their lifetimes. And that's it for our program tonight. Remember, you can follow me and the show on Twitter. Thank you for watching Amanpour & Company on PBS and join us again tomorrow night.